Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Natalie. Welcome, Natalie. I'm so happy to have you here. Hi, Don. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes, this is wonderful. So usually I would have um, the guest explain why they're here, what we're going to talk about. And I asked Natalie if she would do me a favor and read off of her website. It's just like a little 30 second blurb, but it spoke to me and I want you to read it so that um, the listeners can hear why you're here with us today. Thank you. I'm going to read from part of the website, Mama's Got Grit. When our child suffers from addiction, the fear can be crippling. And I'm going to pause there for, for a second. We are constantly on high alert, worrying about how or where our child is or waiting for the phone call that might change our lives forever. There's such a fine line between helping and enabling that we overanalyze our every move, trying not to make matters worse. We are torn between the desire to throw every ounce of our love, time, and money into trying to cure the addiction and the knowledge that we have absolutely no control over our loved one's substance abuse. The intense stress often impacts our physical and mental well-being, while our obsessive focus might jeopardize our other relationships, our financial security, and our careers. When each day can bring new problems and we're constantly faced with impossible decisions, it's easy to feel hopeless and alone. But you're not alone yet. You just haven't found your people and you can get through this. You're just going to need a little grit. Mm. I love that. That gave me goosebumps. Um, I bet it does feel very lonely when you're going through something like that, especially if a lot of your friends aren't dealing with it. And then you don't know like how anybody could understand the position that you're in. What happened? What happened to you? Yes, it's very isolating. Um, the stigma of addiction, the, the shame and the hopelessness is very hard to describe to someone who isn't experiencing something mm -hmm. similar. I think everybody that I meet in life, that I talk to, um, has someone they know, family member, who struggled with some form of addiction. And substance abuse doesn't have to be drugs. It can be alcohol, it can be gambling, it can be pornography, it can be anything. Um, but the mental illness behind the addiction has a stigma attached to it. Um, and it is an equal opportunity uh, employer. You know, high wealth individuals, people living on the street, everyone in between has been impacted. And we read a lot about overdoses. Uh, we know there are uh, not enough, but lots of substance abuse programs out there. For those who are fortunate enough to have insurance or a nice nest egg or generous family. Um, and, and there are uh, recovery programs and detox programs. Um, I personally have financed um, almost a dozen of those for my own son. Wow. There isn't really anything out there for the moms. And as a mom, uh, while my son was dabbling in the beginnings of his substance abuse, I found a lot of isolation. I was alienated by other parents. They didn't want their children to come to my home because they were afraid it was contagious. Yeah. And their kids who were perfect uh, were going to catch a disease um, that they didn't want to have anything to do with. And that lack of awareness, uh, lack of compassion is what drives people into isolation. Uh, it did that for me. And then we make decisions um, based on, um, you know, enabling and what would we not do for our child? And and I speak to dads out there too. I, I am a mom, so I- right. Resonate better with, yeah, with women, yeah. mom, whether you're a stepmom or a grandmom or an adult. Right. Um, there's always that that deep worry that you're going to get that phone call um, that your child's life is over. I've seen it. I've known people who've lived through it. And I kept it to myself for a very long time. Um, it broke up relationships. It destroys families. 
Other siblings don't know what to do, how to handle it. They're triggered. They don't want to be around it. Other family members don't want to listen to it. They, they, they don't know what to do. They can't fix it. And it just drags them down and brings more toxicity into their lives. People give up their homes, um, lose their jobs because their addicted child shows up at work or they're afraid to leave their addicted child at home. So they don't go to work. They, they take their, their nest eggs, their life savings to pay for these programs to send their kids away to wilderness. We did that a couple of times. And I'm going to just jump from that to look looking at people on the street. And, and I'm sorry, I'm not really going in any particular You don't order. have to. You do um, your thing. Okay. <laughs> uh, but when I, when I drive through uh, my city or another city and I look at homeless people, the first thing I think of is they have a mom. They yeah. had a mom. They have a mom. They have someone that played that role for them at some point in their lives. And how are they doing with this? Mm -hmm. Many times I've looked in corners of buildings to see if maybe the person under the hoodie was my son. Mm. When did it start for him? It started back in middle school. Uh, I got a phone call from a girl on his phone who said, uh, Mrs. Anderson, we're taking your son to the ER. He's overdosing. Oh my God. There, there are no words to describe the feelings. And I was so ashamed. What did I miss? How did I not see this? What could I have done to prevent it? Was it the divorce? Was it the early absence of his father? Was it my behavior? Um, was it something that happened at school? He skipped a grade. You know, was it that? He had a very early diagnosis of OCD that wasn't treated. Was that it? What was it? Mm -hmm. and, and how do I fix it? Mm -hmm. That's always the first question. And as they say in the 12-step programs, you didn't cause it, you can't control it, and you can't cure it. Mm. And and that's that's just that's just the reality of the situation. So defeating. I a, yes. I, I was at a conference in uh, Las Vegas and I was wearing my, my badge. My son was um, in middle school at the time. And I was looking around for the lunch, for the luncheon. And I ran into this woman who was also looking around for the luncheon. And if you've ever been to Las Vegas, you know that it's this huge, amazing. Right. <laughs> get lost, right? Yeah. So we just looked at each other and said, let's just go have lunch. And we did, and we were chatting, we were in similar industries, so it was very easy to pick up a conversation. And I said, well, will I, will I see you tonight at the opening? And she said, no, I'm in recovery. I don't, I get triggered by those events and I don't go to the openings. And without my even asking a question, she said, I'm a recovering heroin addict. And my heart just burst. It was the first time that anybody had ever said that to me. Mm. And the first time that I gave myself permission to listen and to talk about it. Wow, this woman's talking about it. Yeah. Like this is this is a conversation that needs to happen. Yeah. She told me her story. She told me about her journey. And we talked about her mom. We talked about how hard it has been for her family, her alienation from her brother. Uh, her relationships being destroyed and she still struggles. I mean, she's in active recovery and knows what her triggers are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that I talk to moms about is know your triggers. I wrote a blog about how to handle the holidays. How do I navigate? I want my, we all want our families together, right? Yeah. I want my son to be here with my daughter. I want everybody together in one room. That's way too triggering for the other people in my family. It's not going to happen. Well, what if he shows up and he's high? Am I going to call the police on my own child? Um, and so boundary setting is something that is really important to learn and very hard to do 
when you're constantly hearing that little voice that says, where is he? When was the last time you talked to him? Pull up his phone bill. Who's he calling? How long has it been? How many days? Is he on his meds? And it's so easy to just be available 24 seven. Sure, I'll hand over money because the stories, if my son could turn those stories into a book, like the manipulative mm -hmm. uh, pretend stories. I remember once he called me one day frantically and he said, mom, where's your boyfriend? And I said, well, he's at work. Are, are you sure, mom? I said, yeah, I don't have any reason to believe he wouldn't be. Right. And he goes, really? Because I thought I saw him walking down the street holding hands with a blonde woman. This was back in my, I don't believe what's going on days. Later that night, my boyfriend came over and we were chatting and he said, you know, the strangest thing happened today. I came home and my big water jug full of coins was gone. Nothing else from my house was gone. They didn't take my electronics, my art, I had credit cards, nothing, just my coins. And I connected the dots in that moment. And I said, oh my God, he wanted to know if the house was going to be open and nobody would be home because wow. the door open for his cat and off went the coins. Oh my gosh. I'm on a first name basis with the owner of a pawn shop. Why? Because my jewelry has been stolen so many times. Talk about invasive. I couldn't <laughs> imagine that. Just that, like I, you said, you have to have these boundaries, but it's at the same time, it's your child. But then at the same time, you don't want to enable. Correct. And you, you need sleep. I mean, that's exactly where you're coming from as a mom, a parent that your nervous system isn't going to be able to take it for the long term of constant worry, constant waiting. Oh my God. If you mentioned sleep, let me talk about a boundary that I had to set. Most of the activity goes on during the night. So I decided my, one of my boundaries, and I tell this to my moms, turn your phone off at nine o'clock. Don't answer it. Don't be tempted. Whatever call is going to come through, it's either the current drama that you don't need to deal with before you go to bed, or at all, for that matter. But start by setting just one boundary, and maybe it's the phone. Mm -hmm. For me, that's been a lifesaver. I might wake up one morning and see that my phone's been blown up two, three, four o'clock in the morning. And I'm glad I didn't know about it. And if I do choose to follow up on the reason... It's usually history anyway. So it's really about, I call it grit, uh, resilience, being able to put yourself first. The old adage in the plains, put your mask on first. You can't take care of anybody else if you're not taking care of yourself. And they don't teach us that in momhood. No. It's not Cliff Notes version. No. It's not religions. It's not anything. Right. So and, and you do blame, blame yourself, even though it has nothing to do with anything that you did, but I could see where you would turn and just be like, like you said, a divorce. I went through a divorce mm -hmm. and I remember thanking God every single day that my kids stayed on the straight and narrow, because I knew the, the odds, you don't know what's going to happen with your kid. You try and do your best and you hope for the best, but Every parent, whether it's a divorce or not, you, you worry, did I do enough? Did I, am I doing the right thing? You know, especially with that firstborn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, well, the guinea second, pig. But I understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> the guinea pig child, you know, just, yeah. I, so what, how, so what do you, what do you do with regret? I think that's where you're going. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, go, go. I have, a, I have a notebook. Remember the old-fashioned notebooks with the tabs? Okay, yeah. I, I have one. Uh, well, I actually have volumes of them, but <laughs> I have a current one. And sometimes I name the tabs differently, but I always have a tab called regret. And I write in it when it comes up. 
I just move away from what I'm doing. I sit down with my dog at my feet and I write. What if we had put him on the meds that the doctor suggested? What if when three boys in middle school were suspended and my son got expelled and sent to the bad kids school and I sued the school district but didn't get him back in, what if that wouldn't have happened? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the school's fault. Maybe it's the friend's fault. Maybe it's the parent's fault that wasn't home and let the kids have a party mm -hmm. unknowingly. How do you stop that spiral? Letting it out. Mm. I write it down. There are a million regrets. I mean, we have regrets every day, right? Right. Oh, if only I'd gotten up earlier, I really would have gotten my butt to the gym today. Right. Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's every day for me. <laughs> Oops, a day. Well, why do you think I picked that example? Hello. <laughs> Dude, that's and, 800 days in a row. <laughs> I'm going to get you a notebook, Don. <laughs> I have them. I have oh, okay. them. Yep. <laughs> I you use like mine spiral. every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do too. And yeah. Yeah, the constant fear and the what if. And what am I afraid of? What am I really afraid of? I'm, gonna, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my son. I've seen what it does to parents and communities. There's a cemetery near where my kids grew up. I know six of the children that are there. Mm. And the parents that it destroyed. Where is it now? What What's happening now? With my son or with the... Mm -hmm. yeah. With your son. Uh, he is in a constant state of relapse and recovery. Okay. This is after 12 rehabs from having him taken away during the night to him voluntarily going someplace and voluntarily leaving. Now, once a child becomes an adult at 18, they can't be kept against their will. Mm -hmm. And this is a condition like any other. If you have a child with diabetes, a child with cancer, they have to want to get better. And it is possible to get better. Uh, one of my favorite musical artists, James Taylor, he was a heroin addict and that ruined his marriage and he turned it, he turned his feelings into music and he recovered. And, and there are many, many, you know, and then on the other side of the coin, um, I have a friend that works for the Jimi Hendrix foundation that didn't end so well. Right. So we know the statistics I mean, you can go to the CDC and look at the numbers, and those are just the reported deaths. Right. There are many that are unreported, many people who are, you know, Jane Doe's or John Doe's. And I think it's above my pay grade to be able to do something about the opioid crisis. I try to do little bits here and there. There are many organizations like the Partnership to End Addiction. A lot of them are on my website where you can you know, donate as little as $5. You can volunteer your time. And helping is helpful. Mm -hmm. Knowing that I'm doing some small part to raise an awareness for the moms about the stigma and everything they go through. Look, we, we grew up in, we grew up in leave it to beaver time. I, I did. Yeah, no, <laughs> I know. Era, yeah. you know my, I was going to be Jim Cleaver. I even have the pearls. And we we're <laughs> going to have this perfect little family, right? And we, we all have these images of what life is supposed to look like. And then boom, something happens and we're not prepared. I don't know what could prepare us. Something else I share on my website is that my father was a gambling addict. And I grew up never understanding why my parents fought constantly, Dawn, every single night. It would, I mean, it it turned my insides out yeah. when I was a teenager. And I never knew why until finally, when I got to be an adult, I realized the extent of his illness. And it was our shameful secret. Nobody right. knew. Were you able to talk to your mom about that and ask her like how she 
coped with it? I mean, or was it just fighting? That's just how she dealt with it. And that was it. That, that was what they knew. Mm-hmm. Fighting. And I was told as a child, you know, this doesn't have anything to do with you. What are you, why are you upset about it? Like, well, because I'm the only child living at home right now. Right. And every night I go to bed listening to this, putting my cheek against the cold stucco wall to calm down or mm. try and find a happy book of stories to read so that I could go to sleep. Oh, gosh. It wasn't talked about. Yeah. It would have been very different had it been talked about. So do you feel like this whole group that you have started, Mom's Got Grit, like, do you feel like that is not only your contribution, but your therapy? I do. I do. That's a, that's a, that was very well put. Um, And caveat, I'm not a therapist. I, Mm -hmm. I don't speak in therapeutic terms. Well, I've had many therapists over the years and I still do because for me there's there's value yeah in, that's what I was going to ask you next communicating as you and I are communicating mm-hmm. today um, and knowing that I'm not alone right and that's part of the reason why I formed this community is I, I grew up in the human resources field and mm-hmm. I have a lot of experience with recruiting and interviewing people and uh, asking questions and navigating the craziness of the corporate world I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, Mm. which most people know is, it's an autoimmune condition, but it's really brought on by stress. Um, And so I exited the corporate world for my sanity and I got a certification in life purpose and career coaching. And I started working with people individually who were in transition Mm -hmm. uh, in their careers for various reasons. And so A few years ago, I took a step back and I thought, okay, how do I bring all this together and and help? Mm -hmm. I've been to many groups. I've hosted workshops. I've hosted retreats. And every mom values tremendously the connections that they make. They might just be for the minute or for the hour. Some of them are are, go on for years or they're, they're lifelong. Everybody in my tiny little circle of friends has been impacted by addiction in some way. A well, child, and yes. like you said, that people just don't talk about it. I mean, I told you before, I'm a former hairstylist. You know, there hairstylists hear stuff. You know, we hear. Oh, you're our of, therapist, right? For a yeah. lot of people, <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of times we go home, we're like, "Oh my god," you know, cleanse, cleanse. But um, it, it's with anything. If if somebody in your family has to have their gallbladder taken out, all of a sudden everybody you talk to is like, "Oh yeah, I had to have <laughs> mine out." Joe Schmo over here had. It's 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 like as soon as you say it. Yes. Then people start, you start gathering your people because yes. all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, my cousin, my uncle. And then you start to feel like, wow, I'm glad I said something because otherwise yes. I would have felt like it was just me. It's just my family or yeah. I, I just think what you're doing is phenomenal. Have you considered writing a book? Mm, funny you should say that. I've started. <laughs> I have a lot of, as I said, I, I do a lot of writing. Um, yeah. and, um, I started a book. It's called Crooked Stitches. Um, I'm not sure yet when it's going to be out, but stay tuned. Awesome. I think that's wonderful because not everybody wants to go to a group. Not everybody wants to. And it's, it's a closeted way of connecting with someone that's been through what you're going through or have been through and books are, I love books. I, I do too. They're wonderful. So I think that's great. And, and especially the regrets part, because it, we all have, like you said, we all have regrets about mm-hmm. everything that happens in our life, stupid stuff, big stuff, you know, everybody has the regrets, but actually seeing it written down, I hope you give yourself some grace sometimes and think, what would I say to somebody that came to me and had these same regrets? What would I say to them? Mm-hmm. Give yourself that same grace. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know what it's like to be in your shoes but I commend you for being so strong and using it for good, for trying to help others. And I, I, 
I can't imagine how fulfilling it is when you do help. And you've got to hear stories that make you feel like it could be worse, I guess. Yes, there there are many, uh, many, many Facebook groups and other social media groups for moms of addicts. And what I found is that people release a lot of information and their fears, and that's healthy. What was missing for me were the solutions other than, you know, we're praying for you and, and I, I'm not, I'm not dissing prayer at all. No, no. But, but what is the solution for the mom? And I try to write back, you know, what have you done for yourself today? One of the things that I do is every morning uh, when I get up, before I brush my teeth, when I go into the bathroom, I smile at myself. <laughs> you have a beautiful smile. <laughs> <laughs> Not that cheesy. Okay, let's do something. Everybody smile. But like really smile at myself with love. And this is your day. You know, I don't even give it a lot of thought. Just, just smile at myself. And sometimes I write affirmations, you know, with lipstick on the mirror or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's really helped me kind of lighten up. You know, I put some music on James Taylor's, you know, yes. um, I dance around a little bit. And, and a lot of the tools that I use when I'm working with women are about finding their joy again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, thinking about a time I, I liken it to watching a little child go to the beach for the first time and watching the delight on their face when they touch the sand when they smell the salt water and they hear the waves and they have toys and just that ecstatic joy. Right. What were you doing the last time you had that moment? And why are you doing more of it? Yeah. And yeah. I use some of the career coaching tools to take people back to what do they really love to do? You know, baking brownies is your thing. Gardening is your thing shopping for plastic flowers for your zoom is your thing <laughs> whatever whatever you're saying you know let's map that into your day or into your week and it becomes something to look forward to and learning how to love ourselves as women with all the body shaming and all the hashtag business that i would say the majority of us have experienced at some point in our mm -hmm. lives we're not starting with an advantage yeah and we have to give it to ourselves. We have to say, I'm deserving. You know, all the messaging that we got as children. Um, I have a, you know, you can tell I'm old school with the notebooks and the file folders, right? But <laughs> filing cabinet in, in my brain, obviously that this is all visual, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. While I visualize. <laughs> um, and so in that filing cabinet, I have the hanging folders. And in those hanging folders, I have manila folders. And as an example, I have one that has my ex-husband's name on it, and I have one that has my son's name on it, and my daughter's name on it. And as things crop up in my mind, and I feel like they're taking me away from where I really want to be, I stick them in there, say, oh, gosh, you know, remember that time that you picked him up in South Chicago and bought this story about he was getting back my jewelry and oh my gosh, what an idiot I was for buying into that. And okay, stick it in my son's folder. Because when I go to sleep at night, I shove all those files in the drawer. I lock it. And I know that tomorrow it's all going to still be there. And I can look at it again. And over the years, the folders get smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually I throw them away because I don't need them anymore. Yeah. Um, I've sort of reprogrammed my, my brain to say, you're right in the middle of a workout and you want to be watching Dawn's podcast, <laughs> listening to something. Why are you thinking about, I haven't heard from him. He was supposed to, you know, I was supposed to pick him up for the dentist and he's blowing me off. Why are you thinking about that right now? Stick it in the folder because it'll be there later. Yeah. And that may not work for everyone, but it, it really, it really works for me. So with a little bit of sharing 
And I'm still grateful to the woman at the conference in Las Vegas for opening me up and for mm -hmm. opening herself up to speak um, and, and being grateful to have been there with her. Um, that story has stuck with me for a long time. Setting some boundaries, a few at a time, being resilient, writing, talking to people, reading, finding ways to connect with other moms and provide solutions. Everybody has a story. Everybody's handled handles things differently. Right. But you might get an idea from someone that works in your life. Yeah. I do. Yeah, that's okay. wonderful. Oh my gosh. I have loved this conversation. And just because you're very inspiring, it's easy just to lay down and cry all day. <laughs> it's it easy is. to do and that. Some, and sometimes that's going to be the day you're going to have a cry day. Right. Right. We're all cry, entitled. I had a cry day yesterday. Um, my son had an accident that involved drugs. He had third degree burns after passing out on a floor heater in a hospital. And after three surgeries, his hand will never be truly functional. Oh my gosh. And sometimes I look at him and I want to smile and I want to just give him love and love. And I have to turn around and just cry. It's so sad. It didn't need to happen. Mm -hmm. And he's in his early thirties and he was into coding. He loves computers and coding and he can't do that anymore. Wow. Yeah, that's so sad. It is. And sometimes we just have to be sad. Yeah. And there's a lot of sadness in the world. Uh, we can't take it all on our shoulders. I give myself some sad time. I, I give myself sad time as often as I need it. If I'm feeling sad, I'll just right. stop and say, hey, I'm going to go cry right now. Mm -hmm. Because it is sad. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, all we can do is take the best care of ourselves possible with, with what we have. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You have to take care of you first. Cause if you're not here, who else is going to help, help him? Right. Yeah. Wow. So Natalie, tell everybody how they can find your website, find you and um, connect with you if they are dealing with the same kind of issues. Thank you. I would love that. So my website is Mama's Got Grit. Think a bit of having grit. We're going to help you get some. And a couple of opportunities. I provide one-on-one -on -one coaching, in-person and virtual workshops. We're going to start a, a curriculum so other mamas can take this into their communities. Stay tuned on that. But just reach out to me to talk about anything. Um, I offer free coaching sessions. Uh, I hope that you've seen through this conversation that I have a lot of passion uh, for this topic and for all of our children, um, and, and I really want the best for them, and we have to be on our own journeys as well. So right. I look forward to chatting with anybody that wants to talk about anything. That's awesome. And, I'll put now, all... now John and I are going to both go to the gym, right, John? <laughs> No. Don't lie to these people. <laughs> <laughs> they know better <laughs> for me anyway. Um, I'll put all of that in the show notes too, so that they can just look down in the show notes and know right where to find you. And please, if you end up getting that book out there, which I think is a hundred percent a must do, uh, feel free to come back. I'd love to have you back on. You can talk about it. And it was such a pleasure to meet you. Likewise. It was, you made it very fun. Oh. Thank you so much for the opportunity, really. Oh, yeah, it was great. Okay, I'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks a lot, Thanks, Natalie. Tom. All right, bye-bye.